Hello and welcome to History's Terrorists. I'm Tony McMahon yet again here in my study in South London talking to you about another example of terrorism from history. Now, as I've told you before, uh, well, you've probably seen me on TV, on documentaries about history and science, but I also have this other life, and that is I'm a communications consultant on countering violent extremism and terrorism. Uh, I've even written a book on the subject with the UK government's czar for countering violent extremism. Um, and I also, back in the 1980s, well, I was something of a, an extremist myself, I suppose. I was uh, a Marxist-Leninist in the early 1980s, though I never condoned terrorism. But I understand the process, I believe, of radicalization. So what we're going to do in this series is to look back at individuals and organisations that we may once have considered to be heroic or noble or courageous, but now I think on re-examination, we may think, hmm, maybe they were terrorists. And in which case, would we have sided with the authorities or with them? Today, I want to look at the story of a black British Georgian rebel who was caught up in a conspiracy to assassinate the entire British government. Now, when I say Georgian, for our American viewers, I don't mean uh, the state of Georgia. Sorry to sound patronising there. I'm sure you know exactly what I mean, but just in case. Or, for that matter, the country of Georgia. What I mean is that period in English history covered by the reigns of George I, George II, George III and George IV. They all ruled consecutively. By 1820, when this uh, plot was hatched, George IV was the king. Uh, he was narcissistic, unpopular, hideously corpulent, cared more about his own pleasure than the condition of the people. His father, by the way, was George III, who you'll know as the Mad King who lost America. Now, a few years before, the wars against Napoleon Bonaparte had come to an end at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, you remember Napoleon, he was trying to put Europe under the French heel, but that all came to an end at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, you'd think that would be a time of national celebration, but I'm afraid not, because what it heralded was economic recession, poverty, and a heck of a lot of discontent. Ex-soldiers and civilians ended up becoming rough sleepers and this led to the passing of something called the 1824 Vagrancy Act, which made sleeping rough basically illegal. Uh, at the same time, there was a massive increase in stealing and burglary as people tried to survive. There was no welfare state back in those days. And if you look at the court records, you can see people being sentenced to death for stealing or being transported to the colonies, which was a slow death working on the plantations. Looking at the records for the Somerset Assizes, that's the courts in southwest England in August for 1820, we can see court hearings for assault, robbery, stealing of five pounds, sheep stealing, counterfeiting banknotes, stealing cloth, etc. A lot of these resulting in death sentences. Sometimes there were reprieves, but as I said, those reprieves might just mean that you were transported to the West Indies or Australia. This was a time when the sight of teenagers being hanged for any number of crimes was a commonplace. And in fact, in one account of the Cato Street conspiracy that I found in a contemporary newspaper directly underneath was uh, the stories of several young people up before the courts. So, for example, we had 18-year-old Henry Hawkins who'd stolen a tin cash box from a shop. Uh, now, he was sentenced to death, though he had struck the wife of the shop owner several times with a pistol. But anyway, he then ended up hanging from a rope, as did six other youths also found guilty of theft. And there's the rather pathetic account of a 13-year-old who is in tears in court begging for his life after stealing a pocketbook. So unemployment, high taxes, the cost of food was rocketing, skyrocketing. Now, you may uh, find this 
somewhat familiar, I'm afraid to say, but add into that, that the working class had absolutely no representation in Parliament at that time. So there were no safety valves for kind of letting off steam. As a result, there was a lot of violent radicalism going on under the surface. Our rebel was a man called William Davidson, born in Jamaica in 1781, more than likely the illegitimate son of the Attorney General of Jamaica and a local woman who we think was a free woman. His father was a prominent defender of slavery, but nevertheless he did encourage his illegitimate son, William, to go and get an education. He sent him to Glasgow to study law. But from his teenage years, uh, William Davidson doesn't seem to have been that interested in his studies. He gets involved in radical activity. He drops out of his studies. He's press ganged into the Navy. That's a kind of form of recruitment on the streets that used to be used where there was no choice. You had to join if, they, uh, if you met one of these press gangs. But once he got back onto dry land, William became a cabinet maker. He got married, he converted to the Methodist church, and he started teaching in a Sunday school. But respectability just wasn't Davidson's thing. He got drawn back into radical politics after the so-called Peterloo massacre, where a workers' demonstration in Manchester was put down with a huge amount of violence. After that, he joined a secret society called the Committee of Thirteen. Now, the committee followed a violent extremist revolutionary called Thomas Spence. He believed that Britain needed a revolution, just like the one they'd had in France, which had resulted in the king being guillotined. He also believed that the land should be seized and should be divided up among the people. And Spence published a radical journal articulating these views, which had the title, which I find quite amusing, of Pig's Meat. Davidson fell in with the Spencians, the followers of Thomas Spence. Now, they'd already had brushes with the law, uh, and they also had government spies in their ranks. One of the leading Spencians was a man called Arthur Thistlewood, uh, and he would boast that he could raise 15,000 rebels in 30 minutes to take on the government. Uh, what he didn't realise was that his words were being sent directly back to the authorities by the government spies in his ranks. By 1820, Thistlewood was convinced by another Spencian called George Edwards to embark on a very daring plot to assassinate the entire government while they were at dinner at the house of a man called Lord Harraby in Grosvenor Square, uh, central London. Uh, and this would be Lord Liverpool, the Prime Minister, and the absolutely hated Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, and the rest of the cabinet. Castle Ray was absolutely hated, probably the most detested politician of the 19th century. And what he was, what he was loathed for was his penchant for repression, because these were times of a lot of radical, extremist, rebellious activity after the Napoleonic Wars. Castle Ray's answer to the problem was repression, crush it. His contemporary, the poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote these lines about Castlereagh. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Now, Davison joined the plot not just because he was a dedicated Spencian, but he'd also worked for Lord Harraby in his house, so he had inside information. Now, the problem was that Edwards, the person who suggested to Thistlewood to embark on this plot, was a government spy, and everything they were plotting was being relayed back to the authorities. Some of the conspirators did have their suspicions about Edwards, and they, they said to Thistlewood, look, we think this guy's a bit dodgy. Should we be listening to him? Should we be listening to his suggestion that we go and kill the whole government? But Thistlewood was convinced by Edwards. He thought he was a good Spencian, and this was a great idea. Now, in the subsequent trial of the plotters, 
there was a suggestion that Edwards had directed the plot a little too heavily, uh, and that was used by the defence for the plotters to try and throw the case out. Anyway, the government was having none of that. Thistlewood then and Davidson put together a group of plotters who uh, then embarked on this pretty insane uh, idea of killing the whole government at dinner. Now, Davidson went and sounded out his old colleagues, the staff at Harabi's house, you know, just asking them innocently, oh, is the government coming around for dinner? Everybody at the house said, no, 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 Harabi is out of town. He's not going to be there. This isn't going to happen. Yet when Davidson relayed this back to Thistlewood, Thistlewood was still convinced that they should go ahead with the plot. Edwards had really done a number on Thistlewood. He'd convinced him this was a great idea and they should proceed. So the plotters based themselves in a hayloft on Cato Street, not far from Grosvenor Square, and began making their plans. But the whole thing really didn't last very long. Suddenly, 13 Bow Street runners, these were the forerunners of the modern police, burst into the hayloft and there was a gunfight between the plotters and the Bow Street runners, uh, in the course of which Thistlewood actually managed to kill one of the Bow Street runners and then they all fled. However, very soon everybody was rounded up. Um, it, it was all over and they were now going to have to face the courts and the inevitable what would happen to people who plotted against the king's government. The trial of the prisoners became one of those events in London where the mob turned out to participate in the usual rowdy manner. The prisoners were all being held in the Tower of London on charges of high treason, like so many famous traitors before them. On the day when they had to go to court, they were met by the sheriff of London, the under sheriffs, and the keeper of Newgate Prison. They were handcuffed, then each placed in a separate carriage with three Bow Street officers. Now, this procession went through London, accompanied by the lifeguards, who are a, a unit that you still see on royal events today, but this was a slightly more grim event. So this large group then of prisoners, Bow Street runners and lifeguards made their way through the old city of London from the Tower of London down to Newgate Prison, where the trial commenced. Newgate had been a prison for centuries and frankly a blot on London's landscape. It was eventually closed and demolished at the turn of the 20th century and replaced with the Central Criminal Court, known by most Londoners today as the Old Bailey, the name of the street on which it stands. Now, contemporary accounts say that there were huge crowds that turned out to see the conspirators making their way from the Tower of London to Newgate. I mean, this was an incredibly popular trial for the London mob. The charges the conspirators faced were based on a whole string of laws dating from the 14th century up to the present day. One charge came from a law passed under Edward III in the 14th century, accusing them of compassing, imagining, inventing, devising, and intending to deprive and depose our Lord the King from the style, honour, and kingly name of the imperial crown of this realm. There were less prosaically worded laws from more recent times, basically saying they were guilty of insurrection and rebellion and the punishment for high treason was a particularly gruesome form of capital punishment. Davidson was described in reports of the trial as a man of colour and a worthy coadjutor of Messrs Watson, Thistlewood and Co. This was a kind of backhanded compliment, I suppose, to Davidson and, and recognised his leading role in the conspiracy. His height and athletic build were also noted in one report. By contrast, another conspirator was described as a hoary ruffian and a short squat man. Davidson, of course, was educated and he had received some legal training and so uh, his defence was actually quite eloquent and that was noted by the newspapers. At one point he cited Magna Carta, the great charter that King John had uh, signed in 1215. And uh, uh, Davidson said, 
It is an ancient custom to resist tyranny, and our history goes on further to say that when another of their majesties, the kings of England, tried to infringe upon those rights, the people armed and told him that if he did not give them the privileges of Englishmen, they would compel him by the point of the sword. Would you not rather govern a country of spirited men than cowards? Fine words from Davidson, but unfortunately for him, uh, King George IV and his government would rather have governed compliant cowards than spirited Englishmen. In his final words before being sentenced to death, he said that, well, he didn't fear death, he could only die once. The traditional form of execution for high treason was to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Uh, that meant basically you were dragged to the place of execution, you were then hanged until you were half dead, you were then brought down still conscious, uh, you were basically dismembered, intestines pulled out, all sorts of very unpleasant things. Uh, and then you were basically chopped up and your different parts of your body were displayed in different parts of the kingdom. Now, this was 1820, so the judge kind of went for what I think he took to be a modern variation. He decided they should be hanged until they were completely dead and then beheaded. And that would be OK, he thought. It was said that when Davidson heard the details of his execution, he seemed wholly unconcerned. On Monday the 1st of May 1820, the scaffold was prepared outside Newgate Prison for a public execution. There would still be public executions in England for another 40 years. The scaffold was draped with a kind of black cloth. Uh, there was obviously the ropes for the hanging and there was a block for the beheading of the bodies. There were also five coffins on the platform. Huge crowds gathered to watch the execution, as was customary. Every window, top of every building, blocked with people from five in the morning. And in a room nearby, several of the conspirators were urged to pray for their mortal souls. Now, most of them said, absolutely not, go away. Davidson, it was noted, did pray very fervently, it was said, took a glass of wine and also took communion. When the Cato Street conspirators appeared on the scaffold. They seemed to be in a quite a, a belligerent mood. Thistlewood kept saying, I don't want to pray. I don't want to hear about prayers. Another of the conspirators started singing about death or liberty. But Davidson came out and his composure was noted by journalists at the time. One paper said, his behaviour presented a gratifying contrast to that of his companions. His deportment was mild yet firm, and he prayed with great fervency. When he stepped upon the scaffold, he said to those within, God bless you all, goodbye. He joined in the Lord's Prayer and said, God bless the King. He repeatedly expressed great penitence for his crimes. Well, the authorities liked what they saw with Davidson, but they weren't going to show him any clemency at all. All the plotters were hanged and their bodies were left up for about half an hour. They were then taken down one by one and the executioner took a knife and basically cut their heads off and then held the head up saying, behold, a traitor. This went down really badly with the London mob. Now, look, the London mob was not squeamish. But something about this just disgusted them. And there were boos and catcalls. Maybe a lot of people sympathised with the plotters as well. Interestingly, when Davidson was cut down, the mob watched in disapproving horror as he was beheaded. As one report said, no blood had fallen from the other heads, but from this a few drops fell. The hisses and groans of the crowd were repeated on this occasion, while the head was deposited in the coffin which contained the criminal's body. It emerged that Davidson did write to Lord Harrowby, his former employer, making one last plea for mercy, but there was to be no mercy for Davidson because of his involvement with this plot to kill the government. Now, a couple of years later, Lord Castlereagh, that most hated of politicians, who the plotters Davidson had wanted to kill, actually took his own life 
committed suicide. And another poet, Lord Byron, had some pretty horrible things to say. In fact, he left some advice for anybody passing the tomb of Castlereagh. Posterity will ne'er survey a nobler grave than this. Here lie the bones of Castlereagh. Stop, traveller, and piss. Well, that's another story of terrorism. I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's incredibly interesting and a period of history that is absolutely fascinating. I uh, hope you can join me again for another episode of History's Terrorist. But until then, goodbye for now. Goodbye.